uh, as Rowan just pointed out, uh, Accelerate Collections Digitalization Program is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so we call ourselves ACDP for short, um, nice and short acronym. Uh, ACDP has been running for a year, uh, and uh, I'm going to talk through the processes of actual the technical aspects of digitisation, uh, the equipment we use, and um, the sort of successes we've come across in that time. Uh, first of all, sort of why digitise, I guess. And I, I won't stay on this for very long because I think we all know why we're digitising. I mean, uh, it's very common practice these days in GLAM institutions. There's a lot of demand for it. The public are looking for more content, digital content, and institutions want to get their collections out beyond their walls. So uh, that's, that's a pretty common theme. Uh, Tapapa has 2.5 million collection items. Uh, that's an estimate. We have 1 million registered items. Uh, the other 1.5 million are either bulk registered natural history specimens or unregistered at this point. So bearing that in mind, we estimate only 12% have images, so there's an awful lot of work for us to do. Uh, but the last bit, uh, and Flora actually mentioned this, I think it's actually an important part of why digitisation is pretty popular at the moment. And uh, she used a nice term, which was robust technology. I thought that was really important um, because it is about the technology that's available now means that the, the assets that we create really will have longevity, and I don't think you could have said that five years ago in the digital realm, but I really feel like we're there now. So the team. Uh, we have two imaging technicians. Um, obviously, they're running the equipment, taking the photos. Uh, we have one data technician. Uh, it's quite interesting, what, again, with Flora, what she was saying about um, the ratio of the sort of the, the team that you need. It's not just people at the coalface taking the photos. You need quite a large support team as well. Um, and in fact, in larger institutions and um, digitisation projects, the ratio is normally about sort of three staff to each technician. Uh, it depends on the state of the collections at the time. But we have uh, one data technician and they would load all of the um, uh, photos into our, our database, which we use MU here at Te Papa. Uh, and we have a 0.5 collection manager who delivers all the collections to our uh, imaging technicians, uh, helps with handling and any other collection object relation related issues. And a 0.5 rights officer, and this is quite important as well, because when you're digitising, you want to get your stuff out beyond the wall. So it's got to be um, cleared for copyright. And so we want to make sure that everything that we're digitising is cleared, ideally before we get it. That's not always the case, but we have somebody working away to make sure that we've, we can share this beyond our walls quite readily. So here's one of our workstations. It's a flat copy, as I say. So the ACDB project really is 2D. That's what we've worked on for the past year. Uh, and this is our flat copy workstation. Um, as well as investing in quality people, Te Papa also invested in really good quality equipment. Uh, we use phase one equipment, uh, which is a medium format digital camera. Uh, really good um, daylight lights you can see there, so everything's incredibly locked down, and there's a very tight uh, workflow that we work to, and I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, to make sure that the files that we create are really the best quality files. So it's about creating digital assets that are going to last, and there's a process behind that. Uh, we use Capture One software, which you can see there, um, and run it all on Macs, which is quite nice. So when you're looking at a lockdown workflow, you have to sort of establish some standards, and when you're trying to establish those standards, uh, it can be a bit of a rabbit hole, basically. We explored a lot of different areas. Um, we tried a lot of different things. Uh, fortunately, there's two sets of standards out there in the world. That um, uh, One's out of America, it's called FADGI, uh, and the other one is out of Europe, and that's called Metamorphose. Now, these guidelines, they are only guidelines because there's no um, actual standards you can apply, but there's very good guidelines, and these two sets of guidelines are reassuringly similar. Um, which is great because you don't have to choose one or the other. If you choose go with one way or the other, then you know that you're going to be working on a similar level. Uh, and we chose FADGI standards out of America, and that's based, it's got a ranking system of um, stars, so it's from one to four. A four star capture is um, the highest and the best you can achieve. And we set up right from the beginning with this to be a, a working at the very highest international standards or above. That was our goal. So the first part of that recipe is resolution. Um, resolution uh, for a, a FADGI 
four star is 600 ppi or above per object. Uh, now with the digital back that we have, uh, which is a 100 megapixel back, that's relatively easy to achieve for uh, average size objects. In fact, uh, we're generally working well above that four star rating and we don't limit ourselves to that uh, PPI either. If we can capture it above that, we will. There's no point in just um, using half a sensor, for example. Uh, the other part of the workflow is, and this is critical, is uh, colour calibration. Uh, you'll see that there's, this is a capture one window up the top left hand there. Uh, we use digital colour checker charts, uh, so we would photograph that chart in our setup. We would take that image and send it up to a website called Delt AE there. Uh, that website is designed to analyse that chart, so it knows that chart, recognise it, knows what the numerical values of each one of those colours should be, and will give us a report, either it's a pass or a fail mark. Uh, if it's a fail, it'll give us a uh, profile, which we download, we put it into Capture One, we take another photo, and then we reload that uh, new photo of the checker card back up into Delt AE. And at that point, that should give us a pass mark. This part of the process is really critical, I think, especially when doing flat copy work, to make sure that you're 100% accurate with the, with the captures you're getting, that your colour accuracy is bang on. Um, another check we have within, culture, uh, within Phase 1, uh, the Capture 1 software, and this is available in a, in a cultural heritage only uh, version of it, is an overlay. So this, this one on the bottom here has got a white overlay, so it's a digital reproduction of the chart. Each one of these actually has a little hole in it, which will show us what the chart looks like from behind. So visually we can check straight away to see if our colours are in line or not. Uh, and as I say, this is part of the process of really making sure that you've, you're capturing the most accurate version of that work in front of you at that point. And the last part of the equation is file types. Uh, and not everyone comes to the same conclusions on this. So uh, uh, that last workflow, I'll say they, there was a recent survey online about uh, colour workflows throughout other cultural heritage institutions, and that's the most common one currently. Uh, file types, we keep uh, TIFF files only. We keep a 16-bit uh, preservation TIFF, which goes into our uh, preservation repository. So it's buried deep, no one gets to it. Uh, it's there for longevity, uh, and it's, that file is as intact as possible. Um, so it goes through very little or no, basically no processing whatsoever. None of our files go through Photoshop. It comes out of Capture One, straight into KMU. And we also have an 8-bit uh, access TIFF as well, which goes into KMU and is available to staff and also goes to collections online to create the JPEGs for that interface. Uh, once again, keeping only TIFFs is a common work uh, flow for other institutions. Um, we don't keep the RAWs because uh, RAWs are a proprietary file, but also beyond that, um, because we've locked down our capture process so tightly, I'm very confident that should we come back in five years' time, if we had that rule, we'd never get any more information out than we're getting at that point. So we make sure that our 16-bit preservation TIFF has all the data you could possibly ever get out of that uh, raw file, and there's no need for us to keep the rule beyond that. So once our processes are in place, the next thing was, well, what are we going to shoot? How do we start? How do we kick off this? So we started with postcards. Nice and simple, easy to deliver. We had 3,000 of them. We shot front and back. It allowed us, and they, by shooting those 3,000, to lock down our capture processes, lock down our colour accuracy, uh, and, and our workflow beyond that. So from here, loading into KMU, et cetera. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the copyright around these is different from the front to the back. So uh, we were able to release the front of the postcards online quite quickly but we couldn't release the backs until they went through a different process which has now gone, it's gone through and that's because it's got personal handwriting on it. Uh, and the next choice, so again, now I'm sort of talking about um, how we make our choices of which parts of the collection are we going to do. So the next part we did, we, uh, we went to our Works on Paper collection and we started doing all the watercolours within that collection. That's because Te Papa is a large contributor to our watercolour world, which is an online initiative out of England uh, that 
that uh, has Prince Charles as a patron. Um, and they want to tell the story of what the world used to be like in watercolour. So we were immediately looking for a second output beyond our own collections online. So we're looking, we want, again, to spread our assets as wide as possible. They're not just for collections online. We want to, them to be shared across the globe, hopefully. Uh, and beyond, after we had finished the watercolours, we moved into the rest of works on paper. So our works on paper collection was actually reasonably well documented. So we had a whole lot that still didn't have images. So we decided, well, let's try and finish it. Uh, so we started doing the works on paper and we finished that. We had eight and a half thousand uh, works on paper to finish. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of variety in the works on paper. Um, so that's the flat copy workstation. Now we're into the transmissive workstation. Uh, this is one where we shoot all our negatives and uh, transparencies. And uh, where once again, we had new phase equipment, um, particularly a new camera. Uh, we bought this a year ago. It's an IXG. You might be hearing a little bit about that at the moment. Uh, and when we bought it a year ago, this is serial number 52, so it was the 52nd one ever made, um, but when we bought it there was no, also no user manual because it hadn't been written at that point. So it was a bit of a learning curve for us, um, didn't really look like a camera when we got it, uh, but uh, we're really thrilled with the way it's behaving, super reliable, um, super high res, um, and just excellent. So the lenses are also made specifically for flat copy work, so it's about, again, trying to work to the highest quality we possibly could. Now just to give you an idea, so again it's another 100 megapixel back um, of the resolution, a visual cue on the resolution of uh, this sort of camera. Uh, here's a photo of a glass plate negative that we've done on that work stand. If you keep your eye on the top left while we go into uh, CSI mode, and we go enhance, enhance again, enhance again. You see there's a tiny bug that's been squashed into the emulsion. Now we think this bug might have crawled into the emulsion uh, as the photographer, who's James McDonald, was putting the emulsion on in the field. It's a theory, we're not 100% sure, but um, the resolution is remarkable on this camera. So how do we prioritise what we're going to shoot on, in this workflow? So what we do with our collections is it's broken up into photographers, makers. So we started with... Um, we break it up into makers and we started with uh, McDonald, James McDonald, who was working at the Dominion Museum in the early 20th century and he travelled around New Zealand with Elsden Best uh, and took some pretty remarkable photographs actually, really amazing content for, uh, you know, for that era um, and it was a real pleasure to work on all those. Um, we finished all those, that only took us a couple of months to do that. Uh, and then we moved on to Leslie Adkin after that. So again, just another maker. Uh, we hold quite a lot of Leslie Adkin neg negatives. I think we hold quite a, uh, proportionally quite a higher a number of his than any other institution. I think we've got 9,000 negatives and a lot had images, but quite a few didn't. So once again, we wanted to finish that selection. So we worked through the rest of uh, Leslie Adkin's work. Um, his is more, obviously, snapshots of uh, more recent um, New Zealand life. Uh, but one thing we did notice is a bit of a love story. This is his wife Maud up here in the corner. And here, so we, there's a whole selection of photos that were shot just after they got engaged during their wedding, but before children that are really quite lovely. Uh, and after that, we moved on to Rumsey. Again, so we're trying to here mix up the selection process, so we're moving into a different era, uh, moving into colour, so we've got some different variety in the content that we're putting out there and creating. Another part of the workflow we do is proof sheets. Uh, well, that's, for us, there's, there's different reasons for that. So in, our, in this particular proof sheet, for example, it's uh, represented by one record in our record system. So having one photo is the best way to represent that one record. Uh, also in 35mm, in there's a lot of repetition, there's no real need to digitise every single frame um, because sometimes things can be identical. Uh, shooting it this way allows our curators to assess a roll of film and then select the ones that they might come back for higher resolution scanning at a later date. Uh, it makes it all available, so these will go onto collections online, that means the public can see all of these uh, images at once. 
Um, here's another one, just out of interest, and I'll show you sort of how the usability of these, even though they're proof sheets. Uh, this is a selection of uh, images by Glenn Jowett, and it was following a mongrel, mo uh, mongrel mob crew who were on a PEP P uh, um, outing in the 1980s, which is physical work, so they were going out to do some uh, scrub cutting. Uh, so this is them on the way out. So this is just a crop from that uh, proof sheet. Uh, this is them on the way back. Obviously, <laughs> obviously a bit tiring. Um, but when I crop into one of those proof sheets, uh, the single frame image can be printed at A4 at 150 ppi. So they're still really highly usable images. And through this process, we've made 40,000 frames, individual, individual frames, visible uh, through 4,500 captures. A uh, bit of a flashback moment. Uh, this is us digitising our 10,000th uh, collection item. Uh, this was way back in February, actually, and it just uh, happened to coincide with Te Papa's uh, 20th birthday, it was. Uh, that's the image there. Uh, so where are we at now? Uh, we're a little over a year, so it's six months after that point. We're a little shy of 30,000 collection items have been digitised in that time. Uh, the ACTV project, in terms of measurables, was asked to increase the rate of digitisation with Interpapa by 200% would be doing well, 300% would be doing very well. Uh, we actually increased digitisation by 700% on the previous year, so we're doing very, very well. <laughs> Uh, so that's, that's it, that's our process really, so um, I can open up to questions. <coughs> that's a good question, so, uh, and I didn't touch on it, so we shoot, uh, with that colour calibration, we do, we calibrate every month, monthly basis, we shoot the colour target three or four times a day, but if we've got a batch where the lighting doesn't change, then we shoot one target that sits to the side, we shoot each image as high a resolution as we can, and we load that target alongside each of those images into KME. So we've always got a target, it's just not in the photo, but it's shot in exactly the same conditions, and that allows us to maximise the, the resolution of the images that we're capturing. What about the profile, like you know, pro photo or, or layer mode, or what do you think about that? No, we don't associate any profiles, no. No, not in not in the um, in the data that goes into KME. No. Um, you know. With that uh, amount of profiling that you're doing, have you ever noticed any actual drift? No. Now I would say that we we aim to ta to do our profiling every month. We don't actually have achieved we haven't achieved that every month. It might slip off. So we did have a gap there, I think there was three months went by, we went back and reprofiled, no change. And that was down to, it is down to the light, the equipment you use, so those lightings, the lights we use, they did cost a little bit, but they don't move, nothing moves, and that's, that's heartening for us actually. So it's worth it to yep. invest in that proper gear. Yeah. Um, file naming, <laughs> people here want to know about that. Uh, well, file name comes from the collection object first and foremost. So uh, it always everything that we shoot is registered. So it has a registration number. We call it that registration number, and then we've got AM for Access Master, PM for Preservation Master. Um, for us, it's a little bit different from your workflow in that you know normally there's only one or two images that we have, and so AM and PM is sufficient to differentiate between those two that are loaded. Are you shooting a? Um a colour chart ruler accession number shot with every one, or is it just purely the No, it's just purely the work. Because we can link the colour chart that is associated with each of those sessions to that image in our, in our database, we don't need, we don't feel the need to include it in every single image. Um, and then our registration number is enough for us to know where that belongs, so we don't need to see it in the actual image as well. And no one's... No one needs to see a ruler beside them. No, again. So it's again, it's down to the data that's in KMU. So all of this stuff is already measured. Well, it actually alludes to another question, like when we were looking at doing slides. So mounted slides often have information on the outside of them. And so our question to the curators was, should we capture this? So we, should we do two captures, one of the image and one of the slide mount? Try and put them two together, so we're we're uh, not slowing down our workflow too much. 
they came in, they assessed it, and they said, no, don't do it, because we already have that information in, in KMU, and in KMU it's entered, so it's searchable. A photo with text is not searchable. Has anyone else got a question? I think that we can continue this for Hi, Mike. You and I have worked in the darkroom with real negatives, and you know about interpretation. Have you thought about keeping the raw files of the negatives so that in the future they can be reinterpreted, or even open for public to reinterpret as they wish? So the preservation master of the uh, negative is in negative form. So once again, it has all the information that's in the raw file at that point, and that's a one that goes into our preservation repository. That's the one. So you create, we create a TIFF, or in our cultural heritage capture one software, you create a derivative, and you then invert that derivative and you make your changes. That's the same process. So you're essentially using that raw capture at that point, um, or the raw TIFF. And so we can go back and do that at any stage later on, because that process is incredibly <coughs> intuitive and flexible still. Uh, cultural heritage software that we have has inbuilt profiles, but they don't work because uh, film ages, it's not the way it was when they wrote the profiles. Um, and, and it's a good starting point, but then so is just a simple recipe of invert, flip, and then do some levels. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. That's all right, you're just putting me under the hammer. <laughs> a little bit. Um, the uh, capture on software you're running, is that running on a standalone computers, or are they on the enterprise network? Uh, they're on the network. Um, so we are... No, they are on the network, they're, yeah. They're Windows PCs? No, that, it was great, actually. Though That Capture One software is only made for Macs, so we were able to tell IT we must have Macs for this workflow. <laughs> Uh, and it's, it's, so it's working. I know that you guys have had tried this before and ha found it possibly unstable, but we've um, had, we yeah. have no troubles whatsoever with it. So really stable, amazing piece of software, really good piece of software for capturing. Any All good. Thank you very much, Michael. I no think worries. we should show our appreciation.